professor in the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences. So I just found out that Miriam grew up in Miami, uh, Miami, Florida, but then did her undergraduate work at the University of Chicago. <clears throat> and after the University of Chicago, she, for her, uh, and it, this was in the geosciences, she went to the <laughs> University of Hawaii at Manoa and got a PhD in geology and geophysics and subsequently did a postdoc for two years at the Carnegie Institution of Washington, which, which is not in Washington, right? I couldn't, I was gonna look Washington, it up. Washington, DC. It is in Washington. Washington, DC, yeah. Okay, I know that there's Carnegie. There's many, yeah. <laughs> okay, all right. And so we were able to lure Miriam to Santa Cruz in a faculty position in 2017. So she got a two year start and then she was hit with COVID. I mean, unfortunate two years for a, for a new assistant professor, but just, just looking at her website, Miriam has been very active and I think is, is doing well. And her focus is using uh, meteorites to tell us about the evolution of the solar system and the larger universe. So Miriam, you can take it away. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you for that great introduction. I'm gonna share my screen now. I'm a little bit worried about um, my computer and it's been a little bit slow. So if I start to break up a little, maybe uh, you can turn off your videos and we can see if that like helps things out. But let me go ahead and share my screen. Um, so you should be able to see my slides. It looks good. Okay. Thank you. So I changed the title a little bit to because I wanted to make this talk more like a high level talk about meteorites and specifically uh, samples from uh, asteroid Bennu and why these samples will be uh, interesting and important for my research. So ancient cosmic sediment from asteroid Bennu. So that's what I'll talk about. So thank you so much for this invitation. It is really a pleasure to meet with you today. Um, so I wanna talk about, uh, again, Asteroid Bennu and how this is gonna help my research in, in terms of better understanding meteorites and specifically the origin of planetesimals. Planetesimals are the building blocks of, of planets and larger bodies in the solar system. For this presentation, I will first provide an overview of the meteorite record of, the, of solar system formation, so overview of solar system formation and meteorites. And then I'll describe OSIRIS-REx, which is a NASA mission that aims to return a sample from a carbon-rich asteroid called Bennu. And then I'll discuss some like specific research questions that I'm interested in in regards to samples from Bennu. This video is, an, is providing an illustration of what the solar system went through during its birth. So the origin of the solar system from the collapse of a molecular cloud core to the formation of the protoplanetary disk where planets form. What I've always found truly amazing and fascinating is that we have a geological record of these events. Um, readily available to us in the form of meteorites. Uh, geochemical analysis of meteorites indicate that many major events occurred within the first few million years of the solar system formation, including the formation of the first solid material, solid rocky material, and the formation of kilometer-sized bodies called planetesimals. And 10 million years or a few million years, like that sounds like a lot to us, but it's very short compared to the uh, age of the solar system, which is four and a half billion years. Oops, sorry. Um, this is an illustration showing the evolution of the protoplanetary disk from uh, the beginning to about 300 million years after the solar system formed. And what it's showing is that planetesimals form almost immediately, like within 
of million years of the solar system's formation, these kilometer-sized bodies form. And that's what these uh, little speckled dots are showing here. And then with time, most of the planetesimals went into, uh, were either accreted onto the sun, so they were lost to the sun, or they went into uh, building larger bodies like planets through impacts and collisions between planetesimals. Ultimately, this whole accretion process resulted in the solar system structured more or less as it is today. The asteroid belt shown here and the Kuiper belt shown here are regions of the solar system where, lo where large numbers of leftover planetesimals currently reside. So the asteroid belt is between Mars and Jupiter <clears throat> and the Kuiper belt is beyond Neptune. And so these are regions with left that, uh, so these plant, these, uh, this material is basically left over from the initial population of planetesimals. A meteorite is any extraterrestrial rock that lands to the earth. Uh, there are some from the moon and Mars, but 99.9% .9 of the meteorites are fragments of asteroids. So this image on the right is just showing meteorite hunters in Antarctica documenting a spectacular meteorite find. So not only do meteorites provide an incredible record of the solar system's formation, but another amazing thing is that they come to us relatively for free. You know, they, they come to us and we don't have to spend lots of money to go get them from asteroids. Meteorites come in a wide variety. Uh, they can be grouped into two main groups, those that are from differentiated planetesimals or chondritic planetesimals. Mm -hmm. Differentiated planetesimals uh, experienced lots of heating that resulted in global melting, which produced a core and a mantle, so an iron core and a mantle, very similar to the Earth's structure. And chondritic planetesimals experience very little heating and processing. And these are the ones that I'm especially interested in because they retain some of the best geochemical signatures of the initial material that formed in the protoplanetary, protoplanetary disk. Okay, so let's take a, a closer look at a chondritic meteorite. So this is a sedimentary rock of sorts. It's basically a mechanical mixture of many different objects with different origins. So calcium aluminum rich inclusions, also referred to as CAIs, these are the oldest objects in the solar system. This is what we use to get the age of the solar system of like really precise age of 4.568 billion years. And so these are, I'll refer to these uh, here and there as CAIs. So this gives us time, uh, a time zero stamp for when the solar system formed. And we like to compare the formation of other components in meteorites, like the timing, we like to compare it to CAIs. Um, so CAIs have high temperature minerals, minerals that form at really high temperatures above 1300 Kelvin. And then there's also chondrules, which are these all these tiny circular um, features that you see here, they're called chondrules. They are also made up of high temperature uh, minerals uh, above about 1100 K. The exact mechanism for how CAIs and chondrules form is not really, is debated. Um, another thing is the matrix, which you can't really see very easily here, but it's this dark material that surrounds the chondrules and the CAIs, and actually this is also, the matrix is also a mechanical mixture of a lot of different components, including hydrated silicates and uh, metal and all sorts of different minerals. And the temperatures that are thought that the matrix likely experiences low temperature around less than 400 Kelvin. So again, so all of these different components formed under different 
conditions and they tell us something about the different regions in the disk where they form. Okay, so again, chondrites are a mechanical mixture, but one of the challenges with studying meteorites is that they lack geological context. They just fall to the earth to us from space. We don't know where in the astro asteroid belt they're from. We don't know which asteroid exactly um, they came from or where exactly on an asteroid that they came from. So that's, um, that is part of the motivation to study asteroids in more details. So space missions to asteroids have been crucial for interpreting geochemical uh, signatures of meteorites. So this, uh, these images that I got from NASA, they illustrate, they, they uh, highlight some of the main reasons for studying asteroids. So here, um, they include the understanding the formation and evolution of the solar system and ongoing processes that are occurring in the solar system, understanding the delivery, the delivery of water and organics to the earth, especially to the inner solar system, and understanding hazards to life and resources for future exploration. So, um, and, and so here, the, the ellipses, the colored ellipses that you see here are for different NASA missions to small bodies like asteroids. And you can see the different ones cover different topics. NASA's OSIRIS-REx mission shown in this dark orange color. Um, you can see that the topics that this mission is covering. OSIRIS-REx is, stands for origins, spectral interpretation, resource identification, security, and regolith explorer. So that's what OSIRIS-REx stands for. I will just refer to it as OREx. Um, OREx launched in 20, September of 2016. And the mission is to, OREx is a sample return mission to asteroid Bennu, a carbon rich asteroid. Um, OREx has already imaged the surface of Bennu in a lot of detail, collected a sample and it's on its way back to earth. And the samples are expected to arrive in September of 2023. I am not currently a part of this mission, but there is a competitive process where I can apply to become a part of the OREx mission OREx team and be one of the first people to analyze the samples when they return to Earth in 2023. So this is a really, this opportunity is something that I'm very excited about. And um, I'm working, I've been working actually over the past five years towards making myself more competitive for this type of award. And so that's why I really wanted to talk about this subject today. I'm especially interested in this mission because of the potential for samples from Bennu to help us understand meteorites and the origin and early evolution of planetesimals. Excuse me. <coughs> Here is a diagram showing the orbit of Bennu in, uh, in this green. And you can see that Bennu, uh, so Bennu is a, a near Earth asteroid. So it, Earth is here in blue. And that just means that it orbits close to the Earth. And um, actually, actually, Bennu crosses the Earth's orbit about every, crosses near the Earth um, around about every six years. And so you can see why this asteroid is of interest for understanding hazards to life. So OREx reached Bennu in 2018 and took very high resolution images of the surface to determine the best place on the surface to collect samples. So here's what Bennu looks like. Bennu is about 500 
meters in the diameter. And that's comparable to the size of like the Empire State Building, a little bit larger. It's covered in boulders, as you can see, these um, boulders at the surface. And you can also see some relatively large impact craters. Its density is about 1.2 grams per cubic uh, centimeter. This is quite low compared to most terrestrial rocks, which is around three grams per cubic centimeter. And so this tells us that Bennu is mostly a void space, so about 50% or so void space. Um, the reflectance properties of Bennu is consistent. It's very dark, so it's consistent with it being uh, composed of carbonaceous uh, material. Um, so yeah, so the rubble-like nature of Bennu is consistent with Bennu being a collisional fragment of a planetesimal. So this is a piece of a larger body that ex has experienced a really uh, catas catastrophic collisional history. So when I mentioned Bennu's parent body, I'm referring to the planetesimal where this fragment came from. <coughs> After a long campaign of imaging the surface and weighing options for sample collection sites, the Nightingale crater pictured here was chosen. This crater is about 20 meters in diameter. The boulder next to it here is about a, the size of a two-story building. So you can see that the crater is relatively smooth. The material in the crater is relatively smooth compared to the surrounding uh, surface. And so this actually provided a safe, a relatively safe region for the spacecraft to touch the surface and collect the sample. This is showing the sample collection mechanism used to uh, collect material from the Nightingale crater on Bennu. It's called touch and go sample acquisition because the sample collector is attached to an arm on the spacecraft that touches the surface for several seconds and then thrusters push the, the spacecraft away before it crashes into the surface, basically. <clears throat> and so the thrusters push it back into orbit. When the collector contacts the surface, nitrogen gas is released to help lift material and uh, push it in, into the container. The sample collector can collect material that's less than two centimeters in diameter. So they wanted to avoid regions with material that were larger than this. The sample was collected in October of 2020, and it's on its way back with its special cargo. So I want to study asteroid venue as a record of ice-rich planetesimals. So Bennu has spectral signatures that indicate the presence of hydrated minerals. So in this, uh, this graph is comparing the spectral signatures of asteroid Bennu, which is in blue, and to other different uh, carbonaceous meteorites. And these are shown in these other colors. And the meteorites are shown here. The absorption here at two and a half microns is consistent with the presence of hydrated minerals. And you can see all of these types of meteorites show a similar absorption feature. The presence of hydrated minerals on Bennu and in meteorites are indicative of water rock alteration that is thought to have occurred in ice-rich planetesimals. And so that's why asteroid Bennu will, uh, that's why I, I 
uh, that's why asteroid Bennu will be a um, will be really helpful in understanding these types of planetesimals. So IC planetesimals played an important role in the transport of volatiles, so water and organics, to the inner solar system. And um, they were crucial for delivering important ingredients to the Earth. Um, but there's still a lot of uncertainty, especially from the meteorite record about IC planetesimals. And so samples from Bennu can provide some clarity about the origins of these types of planetesimals. For instance, Bennu can help us better understand where in the disk did ice-rich planetesimals form, in the asteroid belt or beyond Jupiter. Currently, the asteroid belt has remnants of both rocky and icy planetesimals. This model uh, is, is showing basically the evolution of the protoplanetary disk. And with time, it's the, the disk is cooling. And so as it cools, rocky and icy planetesimals form. And this uh, snow line is referring to the region, radial distance in the disk where ice, where it's Cool, cold enough for ice to condense in the nebula. And so one idea is that, that the snow line, um, the position of the snow line was where the asteroid belt is currently. And that's why the asteroid belt has um, ice rich planetesimals towards the outer parts of the asteroid belt. And so in this model, Bennu's parent body would have formed in the asteroid belt. Alternatively, dynamical models suggest that icy planetesimals formed beyond Jupiter and were mixed in to, into the inner solar system and the asteroid belt through uh, during giant planet migration. And so giant planet migration occurred. So this, this illustration is showing uh, time on the y-axis and distance from the sun on the x-axis. So the sun is here. And this is uh, zero here is referring to the solar system formation. So this is showing soon after solar system formation, you have planetesimals, rocky planetesimals, and icy planetesimals in blue. And then Jupiter, th these lines are so showing the migration paths of these different giant planets. And we, we can focus on Jupiter, which is the first line. So Jupiter moves inward and then back outward. And this, mix, this process mixes in icy material into the inner solar system and the asteroid belt. So these are two different uh, ideas. And samples from Bennu could potentially if, help us better constrain where in the disk these uh, icy planetesimals formed. Samples from Bennu could also help us understand when and how did ice-rich planetesimals form. Um, here are some thermal evolution models of ice-rich planetesimals with 5% um, water ice and 50% water ice. And this is showing the radius <clears throat> of the planetesimal and versus accretion time. So accretion time, so zero is solar system formation. So that's marked by CAIs. That's why CAIs are mentioned here. Solar system formation, and then uh, up to 4 million, 4 million years after solar system formation. And the lines that I highlight here I'm highlighting 50 kilometers radius, which is what's been, um, what's the current constraint for Bennu's parent body. And um, I'm highlighting the, this blue line is the 300 Kelvin, uh, is for th temperatures of 300 Kelvin. And the main takeaway from this is that, you know, uh, in order to melt ice and a planetesimals, but not completely melt a 50 kilometer planetesimal, 
the planetesimal must accrete um the planetesimal must accrete either um three three and a half million years after three and a half million years in the case of five percent water ice or if it had more water ice um maybe around three million years after solar system formation um and so we can use what we understand about Bennu and its parent body to test these ideas and to do especially um, geochronology of these samples and get a co uh, constraints on exactly when the Bennu parent body formed. There is also some uncertainty surrounding the exact nature of water rock interactions that shape the evolution of these planetesimals. And so here I'm just showing some possible suggestions for what the parent body of IC planetesimals, the what parent IC planetesimals look like. So, you know, questions like, was fluid alteration a local process, as might be suggested by this model? What did fluid flow over large scales, as might be suggested by these models? Was the fluid flowing in a convective? Uh, on, could, was fluid flow convective, or was it, uh, you know, did fluid was the fluid lost to space because asteroids don't have atmospheres? Anyway, so samples from Bennu can potentially help us better constrain um, what the nature of ice-rich planetesimals were like. So to understand um, icy planetesimals, most of my work have been on meteorites and specifically CM chondrites. So CM chondrites are a, a type of meteor chondrite that's um, carbon rich. And also these have lots of hydrated minerals. So they show evidence for fluid uh, alteration. So I've been working on a number of projects involving detailed petrology and isotope analysis of secondary minerals, such as carbonates and magnetite. So secondary minerals are minerals that form as a result of the fluid alteration. And um, yeah, so I'm interested in how and when did specifically uh, carbonates form and what they can tell us about the fluid and ice in the meteorite parent bodies. And Ultimately, I'd like to know where in the disk um, these, this, uh, these ice-rich planetesimals form. So what you're looking at here is uh, an example of a CM chondrite. <clears throat> and so this is a hand sample, this uh, image of, the, of, rock, of a rock on a meteorite on the table here. <clears throat> but I'm showing you what most of my samples actually look like. There are really small pieces of these meteorites that I request from NASA and from other museums. And um, this uh, image in green is a false color microscope image of one of these samples that I just, these thin section samples that I just showed you. And in this false color image, the calcite grains or carbonate grains <clears throat> show up as red. And these calcite grains make up about one weight percent of these types of meteorites. So they're really they're a relatively small proportion of the of the meteorite, but they're really important for understanding for understanding the fluid because we don't have the the rocks in the rocks we don't have the fluid anymore. We can only use the minerals that were left over by the fluid to to study what the fluid composition was like. The largest of these grains is about 100 microns. And this whole image, uh, the green image here is about, about, about a, centimeter, a centimeter across. So why carbonates? Um, carbonates such as calcite and dolomite are special because they record fluid chemistry and conditions such as temperature and oxidation during water rock alteration on the planetesimal. 
So here I'm just showing like the three most relevant reactions for carbonate precipitation. So the first one is showing how shows how CO2 and water um, can produce hydrogen and bicarbonate ions. And then the second one shows that calcium and um, in the solution can react with bicarbonate to produce calcite, which is a type of calcium carbonate and hydrogen ions. And this third one is a combination of these first two. And it's highlighting that the calcite formation is sensitive to the um, amount of CO2, CO2 in the in equilibrium with the fluid. And so, um, yeah, and so we can get information about CO2, it, uh, gas composition and water co uh, composition from calcite. The other reason why calcite and carbonates are especially, and meteorites are especially interesting is because they're old we can date their formation, which I'll talk about a little bit later. And here is just showing a, some of the data from previous work, and you can see the range. It's a wide range, but most of them for, are between about three and seven million years after the formation of CAIs. So my research in carbonates uh, focuses on um, better constraining the timing of carbonate formation using a system called manganese 53, chromium 53, short-lived radionuclide system. That's radionuclides is what I studied for my PhD. Uh, their short-lived radionuclides are, are very important for studying the timescales of uh, the formation of meteorites and their components because they have they provide the time resolution that we need to study um, events that occurred you know within a million years of each other during the solar system's formation. Um, the other thing I'm very much interested in is the temperature and oxidation conditions of the fluid. I approach this by using by analyzing oxygen isotopes in magnetite and carbonates in meteorites and um, comparing my results to experimental work that can that where they've um, changed the temperature and um, so you can to get at the temperature of the carbonates formation. And then redox conditions, I'm using uh, carbon and oxygen isotopes of carbonates and um, comparing that to geochemical models. And something I just recently started was trying to directly analyze the um, amount of Fe3 plus and Fe2 plus, which is the oxidation states of iron in calcite in meteorites to get a more direct um, uh, picture of the direct measurement of the redox conditions of the calcite formation. Um, other things we're interested in is the evolution of the fluid chemistry. So how does a fluid change as water rock alteration is occurring? So we, we use trace element analysis for that. And then the role of impacts in the formation of carbonates and the history of these icy planetesimals by we look at micro tectonics. So we're looking at the stress signatures of stress and strain in on a micro scale, micron scale in, in these meteorites. Um, so let's take a look at some data. Uh, this is showing carbon and oxygen isotope data for uh, calcite, but this is bulk measurements. So this is a, a bulk rock. So think of like a hand sample that they, uh, they that that's basically um, the carbonates in that hand sample are um, dissolved in bulk and for each meteorite and, and the each, so each data point here is for a meteorite. 
And so this, this is giving you a wide range of different CM meteorites, CM type meteorites. And what you see, and this is being compared to models, geochemical models, where um, calcite is precipitating from a fluid in equilibrium with CO2 and CO. And, um, and what they're doing here is they're varying the amount of CO2. So this is calcite in equilibrium with a flu, uh, in equilibrium, calcite formation from a fluid in equilibrium with CO2 and some fraction of CO. And, but in this case, there's no CO2. And this is what you would get. And so when we compare the data for all of these different me meteorites to these models, it suggests that um, the CO2 fraction is about 30%. And there's, but there's a lot of variation. It's not a perfect match to the geochemical data. And so this study by Alexander 2015 is what motivated me to analyze individual carbonate grains to better understand what is the source of this variation in the meteorite data. And so I did that, I started that work during my uh, postdoc at Carnegie. Um, and this is data from my 2019 paper uh, that shows, again, the same plot, exactly same plot, and the models are the same. But this time, these, uh, this is for each data point is not for bulk sample, but it's for individual calcite grain. And um, here, the different colors are for three different meteorites that I analyzed. We have the calcite is in these squares and then dolomite, which is another type of carbonate <clears throat> is in the triangle. So what we see here is that these two different types of carbonates uh, fall, fall into separate groups. And they suggest that the carbonates are forming under different conditions in the parent body. And so specifically, some of them are forming under more oxidizing conditions, so CO, a higher fraction of CO2, whereas others are forming under relatively reducing conditions where you have uh, very little CO2, very little free oxygen. <clears throat> we can estimate the temperature of the fluid during carbonate formation by comparing our isotope results to experimentally determined values. So people, other groups work on, um, they, they can experimentally produce calcite and carbonates in the lab and measure how the oxygen and carbon, uh, specifically oxygen in this case, how the isotope um, fractionate as you ch change the temperature. And when we compare our data to, um, to these model, these experiments, we get a constraint that's at about 125 degrees C with very large uncertainties. Um, this is uh, one sigma uncertainties, oh sorry, two sigma uncertainties. But, um, but you can see here, you know, this looks like a, a large uncertainty, but you can see here that, uh, data from other groups really span a wide, wide range for uh, the temperatures under which the calcite is forming. Again, carbonates are awesome because we can determine their ages using uh, manganese chromium short-lived radionuclide system. In this system, manganese 53 decays to chromium 53. It has a half-life of about of four and a half million years. Because of its rapid decay rate, all of the manganese 53 that was initially present during the solar system's formation has decayed away below detection. So since these carbonates form very early, we can use the manganese chromium system to determine their ages and get at like time scales of their formation. Um, these plots at the top are showing some um, data that I collected in January of 2020. Mm, yes, in January of 2020. And, um, and so this is for two different meteorites, CM chondrites. 
And so this is the manganese chromium data. This is what the data looks like. And we uh, calculate an age from the slope of this data. And the ages inferred from this data range from two to four million years after the solar system's formation. And so I, um, I just put on the bottom here, I'm like comparing the constraints that we're getting from these meteorites to what previous work has, has found. And you can see there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, and this uncertainty in, in the data is coming from differences in standardization between the different research groups. And so that's something that as a community, we need to work on uh, getting better standards, but it's actually not so straightforward because we need to measure chromium in calcite. We need a standard that has chromium and calcite that's homogeneous. And chromium is actually not um, uh, a common thing to find in terrestrial calcite samples. We find them in meteorites because of the decay of manganese 53. Manganese 53 decays to chromium within the calcite structure, and that's why the chromium is there. But otherwise, it wouldn't be there normally. And so it's actually been a, a, a really challenging thing to prepare to have uh, proper standards for these types of analysis. And so, so back to Bennu, um, carbonates and magnetite, so secondary minerals have been detected on the surface of Bennu. And so this is why I'm really excited about these samples and why these samples will really help the work that I'm doing. So this uh, image from, these figures are from Kaplan 2020. And there, this one on the top left is showing these bright features on the surface of Bennu. And um, these are, this, the spectral features of these are consistent with uh, different carbonate grains. Um, and so here, here I'm showing, here, I mean, here are the different, the spectra for different components. So calcite, dolomite, and magnesite, these are three different types of carbonates and then organic material. And then in this plot that's marked A, this is a, a image of the, surf, the surface um, around Nightingale Crater where they collected the sample. And all of these circles that you see here, the colors match with the spectra of these different components. And you can see that most of the, these are consistent with calcite mostly, but there's also some magnesite, which is a magnesium rich um, carbonate and dolomite. And their estimates are that, their estimates are that this makes up about one to two weight percent of Bennu which is consistent with what we see in meteorites. So samples from Bennu will provide context for interpreting fluid alteration signatures of meteorites. And these precious samples will help us better understand the role of water and ice um, in the formation and evolution of planetesimals. Some of the specific questions I'm interested in include, when did uh, fluid alteration occur? And is it, is, um, when did fluid alteration occur in ben, on Bennu? And is that similar to what's observed for, from meteorites? Did Bennu have a metamorphic grade, which I didn't talk about with you, but um, similar to what's observed from meteorites? So meteorites are, um, there, there's evidence that they also have experienced different degrees of metamorphism, uh, which just means like thermal alteration, uh, alteration from heat and water. So that's what, what, what I'm referring to here is a metamorphic grade. And is that similar to what we observe in meteorites? Because that will help us understand how to interpret the variety of meteorite um, meteorites that we have. And did Bennu form in the outer solar system or did it form in, the, in its current position in the asteroid belt? 
and um, and also do different carbonaceous chondrites come from different parent bodies? So the current assumption is that all the different types of meteorite, the different groups of meteorites that we have, so CMs versus other types of meteorites, the assumption is that these are forming on their individual planetesimals. They all come from separate, separate planetesimals. But I'm hoping that Bennu will help us to, um, to better understand if that assumption is correct. And actually, I think it might not be correct. So anyway, so I, that's all I have for today. Mm -hmm. And I want to thank you again for, for inviting me to meet with you and to share my work and my interests. OK, so I'm going to stop the screen sharing here, Miriam. And so questions, questions for Miriam. And uh, look at here in the gallery so I can see if any raised hands, any questions for Miriam here? Okay. Well, I mean, I, I've got a, a couple that I, I wanted to ask you. What one at the at the very beginning, you said that these CI CAI deposits can be used to estimate age. Is is that also done with isotopes? You're basically looking at isotope decay. Correct. Yeah. So CAIs are the oldest. Um, material in the solar system based on their isotopic ages. So we, there's, we've used, uh, we as in the collective, we, we've used um, different systems, uranium lead, aluminum magnesium, hafnium tungsten, different uh, uh, isotopic dating systems. And all of them are consistent with CAI as being the oldest material in our solar system. Okay. And then I noticed that in one of your, your papers, when I was looking through your CV, you, you've worked on some things about defense from astronauts. Is this the question of whether one of these is going to hit us or not? Um, yeah, there's actually, I just joined um, a mission as a team member. So uh, mostly to provide input and advice on a mission called DART, which is um, a mission where they are actually going to a binary asteroid and they're going to send a, they're gonna to try to hit that, the, the moon of the asteroid to see how that affects its orbit. And it's kind of a, a first step in understanding whether what's necessary to divert uh, incoming uh, asteroid. So, you know, the NASA is very much interested in asteroids as un, in terms of understanding their hazards and the potential hazards that these have. Bennu, as far as I, I know, is, um, and that's one of the main reasons why Bennu was interesting to go to for, um, for this mission. So, but do we, do I know of any particular asteroids <laughs> that they've identified that is, Coming to Earth, I don't, I don't know that. <laughs> okay, Jim. Two questions, Miriam. One is for the water that's flowing through something like Bennu, where does it come from? So is this water that is assumed to be primordial or secondary? And the, and the other at a more human level is how difficult is it to become, to get a sample? Of Bennu, how many people are ahead of you in the queue? Uh, what oh, do you gosh. have to do? Um, well, the first one, I you know, I did, I didn't go over that, and that's a good question about where does the water come from. So, the so when so during the solar system formation, depending on where in the disk the planetesimal forms, it will accrete ice, ice of different compositions, so water ice maybe even CO2 ice, et cetera. And so depending on where it formed, it accreted ice and some of them didn't. So we have meteorites that show no evidence for having accreted ice. And then the ones that have lots of hydrated phases and secondary minerals, those show evidence for having accreted water ice. 
And so that water ice comes from its initial ingredients. And so the, the water comes from, um, the reason why there's water is because uh, of heat. So they experience some heating, likely from uh, the decay of aluminum 26, uh, so radiogenic heating that melted the ice that they accreted. And that's where the water comes from. And then how hard is it to get a sample of it? You know, this is my first time trying. So, the, so there, haven't, there hasn't been so many missions like this. So there, uh, the Japanese Space Agency actually just brought back a sample from a similar type of asteroid as Bennu. But, um, you know, so this is my first time going through this. I don't know. But what I know is that they're only selecting five people. So they're only going to select five proposals and the, they're allocating $5 million for this. So um, I expect it to be a very competitive process, which is why I started th thinking about this a long time ago. And I have a lot of data that you know, I plan to put into this proposal. So I feel like I'm gonna be very competitive to, to get some samples, but I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it'll be very competitive. Uh, everyone in our community that studies meteorites will be trying to get samples. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Lincoln, you had a question and you're muted. Okay, How, how's that? Good. Okay. Um, yes, I, I was curious to know whether all of the water on Earth comes from asteroids or whether Earth had its own store of water that survived all of the early Earth uh, states. Yeah, that's that question is a, a that's a debated topic. So um, most people, I would say most people think that um, water is from, was delivered to the earth. Why? So the reason is because the earth, the earth's orbit is in a region where it was hot, it was too hot for water to be present as liquid water on the material that's accreting to form the earth. So, so at least that initial material that the planetesimals that formed in the region where in the one AU region where the earth formed, that was probably dry material. So, um, so that's why people prefer the, um, the idea that earth's water came from either asteroids or comets, but Asteroids to me makes more sense and has recently um, isotope, isotope work have tied the composition of water on the earth to asteroids. <clears throat> but there's a group of people that think the water for the earth could have just been accreted with that, with the material, the planetesimals that it formed from. So if you just because the Earth's water is really just a small percentage of the bulk material, and you can they they argue that absorbed water could have um, could could be the source of Earth's water, so that you don't necessarily need to bring it from the asteroid belt. But uh, that is something that's debated between different research groups. <clears throat> Thanks. Okay, uh, Roger. Um, I, I, I'm just curious if is there any possibility of finding or recognizing uh, uh, any possibility of pre-solar system interstellar dust, interstellar grains in this material that's being brought back? Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure that's one of their um, their objectives to study pre-solar grains. So pre-solar grains are circumstellar dust grains. So these are dust that formed around other stars that um, died. And those stars you know, send material throughout the whole um, region, interstellar space. 
And some of that gets collected in the molecular clouds. And then eventually during the solar system formation and planetesimal formation, some of that material actually survives this whole process and we have them in meteorites. So I am, that is one of their, one of their objectives is to look at pre-solar grains. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, I would say the top objectives, so I, and I expect that they will find a lot of that. I expect, so based on meteorites, if, if Bennu is a CM chondrite, they will find some of the most hardy pre-solar grains, the ones that are resistant to fluid alteration, because these are things that are so small that they can be um, they can be destroyed very easily. So you they they will probably find silicon carbide, um, graphite pre-solar grains. And so this is silicon carbide and graphite from other stars that we that we have in our collection. It's pretty fascinating. But um, their main objectives, from what I can uh, tell, is when they get the samples, the main thing will be to characterize the sample. And one of the important things that that they're focused on is homochirality, which is looking at the handedness of the organic material and trying to get a better understanding of the source of organic material for the earth, because the earth's organic material has a certain handedness, which maybe the biologists here can say more about. And, um, and a lot of the meteorite work on this has been clouded because of contamination issues and all of that. And so they're hoping that a sample from an asteroid, if you analyze it right away, you can, you can um, bypass the whole contamination problem. Mm -hmm. Uh, Jim has another question. If no one else does, yeah. uh, so I was curious about the gravity on Bennu. I mean, it's a small mass object. So if something weighed a hundred pounds on the Earth, what would it weigh oh, yeah. on Bennu? It must be a few ounces. Is is that correct? <laughs> I'm going to say that's about right, but I, I don't know the exact numbers. That, that's something I should, I should prepare for like my next talk. <laughs> but yeah, you know, um, missions, actually I was recently a part of, of developing a mission concept to an um, asteroid-like object. And they're very complicated because of the issue of low gravity, they spin, they're spinning really fast. The shapes, you know, are all uh, different and not, uh, makes it a little bit more complicated for planning. They're very dark, which also means, you know, you kind of have to get up close to really see what's going on. So, um, so like for instance, for Bennu, they didn't realize that the surface was going to be rubbly the way, that, the way it is because, you know, they just, until they got closer to Bennu. So, you know, you have a billion dollar mission and you don't know exactly what you're going to find when you, when you get there because these objects are small, they're dark. And um, yeah, so, so yeah, so missions to asteroids are really complicated because of low gravity and the darkness of the surface and all sorts of complications like that. Okay. So any other, other questions for Miriam? Yeah, Jim has one final question, which I'm happy to take. Oh, oh okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. No, actually, I, I was talking to Catherine rather okay, than- Okay, sorry. <laughs> your hand, your hand is still raised. Catherine's got one. I, ha I do have a question, Miriam. And Hi, Catherine. Is, Hi there. Where does the name Bennu come from? Who names them? You know, most of the NASA missions, they have like a competition where they invite people to um, provide names. And I think these, most of the time, these are like school kids, you know, school children that give uh, recommendations. And I think that's the case with this mission as well. So Bennu, I think, so, so the mission theme is like ancient 
um, birds. If so, ancient birds. So like, so I think Bennu is some type of ancient bird. So like nightingale. There's there's osprey. There's there. So there's birds in general, and also like ancient ones. I don't know. <laughs> I I don't know the full story, but. Um, uh, I'll, I'll definitely look into that. But the, the theme for the mission is, is birds. So I'm sure that Bennu re is referring to a bird of some kind. Lincoln had Oh, yeah, ancient one. Lincoln? Oh, yeah. I, <clears throat> I've always been confused by the difference between an asteroid <clears throat> and a comet. And a, a, the, the comet is the one with the tail. Is that right? Then it's water. It's mainly water, right? Is that right? Or yeah. So the comets are coming from further out, beyond Neptune, or just beyond 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 Jupiter for sure. Um, and so they're made up of a lot more ice. And so when they when they when their orbit comes close to the sun, that ice um, uh, produces a ice and dust gets released and it produces a tail called the coma. So, so why do they have so much ice? Be, is because they're farther out and there's less gas or something less? Uh, be, because they're, they form further out where it's colder. So in the disk, the temperature during the solar system's formation, the temperature in the disk, it's, it's warmer near the sun and it gets colder as you go out. And so the comets are forming in a region that's really cold where ice, condensed was stable, ice of different compositions was stable, CO2, CO, correct me if wrong, I'm wrong, um, but definitely CO2 ice and water ice. And as they're coming, as their orbits um, take them closer to the sun, they just warm up and that ice isn't stable. And that's why they're called active. They, you know, that's why they have the coma. And Can you give me any actual absolute values for, <laughs> You know what? How how cold is it there versus uh, where these um, asteroids are forming? Uh, um, much? Well, what I can say is that um, you know water ice. So some of the asteroids accreted water ice, and um, so you're looking at about three hundred Kelvin where the asteroid belt is. And so, um, and it gets much lower than that <laughs> as you go for, it, it, it drops really fast. It's a lot. Further you go. <laughs> so the temperature drops really fast and you get things uh, that are stable like ammonia ice and all sorts of things like that. I, I would say probably tens of Kelvin, you know, where um, the comets are forming. So it's a big difference and, um, yeah, so I, that's the main difference. So the amount of ice is probably the main difference in um, comets versus asteroids. And that's like where they form. That's a, as a, func that's a function of where in the disk they form. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much, Miriam. Uh, did you ever get a chance to go out and collect them? I would love to. I have <laughs> two small children. So I'm going to wait a little bit. So, but you know that that program, it's called the ANS, um, ANSMET. It's an uh, ANSMET program funded by NSF and NASA. They send a group of people every year to Antarctica to search for meteorites. And that's been on hold because of COVID the last couple of years. So, and the wait list before COVID was, you know, there was such a long wait list. Um, I'm hoping to go, after tenure and uh, take some time off, kids be around five, then I could fight. Yeah, I'm definitely thinking about it. It's in my plans. Okay. Um, All right. Well, good to see everybody. Our, our next meeting will be with the chancellor either on Zoom, but we really hope in person. After all, it's a free lunch and she's paying and we wouldn't want to miss that. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Okay. Goodbye, everybody. Yes, thank you.